This evening I'm going to share some thoughts with you, but I'd like to entitle this presentation, Do You Know the Truth? I grew up in a religious situation where I always heard this phrase, we have the truth. Or, or, or they would refer to, to people and say, does he belong to the truth? I was a little surprised when I found out that other groups use the same phrase. I've heard Jehovah's Witnesses with it. And I've heard different groups use the same terminology. Do you have the truth? And um, there was a time when I would have expressed things in that same way because I had the same kind of understanding. But I find in the Bible where Pilate asked a question and never stayed around to get an answer. You remember, you remember when Pilate interviewed Jesus? He asked him, Jesus said that he was the truth. He said, whosoever is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him in John 18 and verse 38, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You know, I've wondered sometimes what would have happened if Pilate had stayed to listen. What would he have learned? Some years ago, a long time ago, many years ago, I wrote a little track called The Truth. If I wrote it again today, I would write it a little differently. But at that time, it was my understanding. And um, I took it to the printer, and the printer was, he was a doctor. But he was doing a, a little printing on the side. He had a printing press. And when he looked at the, he, he knew Hebrew. When he looked at the tract, he said, uh, what is the truth? What is the truth? And then he shrugged his shoulders and walked away. So <laughs> I never got to go into that discussion either. It kind of reminded me of Pilate. But this is an interesting question. And if you talk to I can, I can recommend you to maybe a dozen different groups right now that if you go to them, they'll give you a different answer to the question. If you look at the, the landscape of independent ministries, independent Adventists that most of us are familiar with, you'll find that so many of these ministries are pushing a different aspect of doctrine which they consider to be critical truth. I don't want to start naming names are pinpointing ideas, but you can think of many different emphases. And each person believes that this aspect of truth is something that is most important. I mean, most of us believe that the truth about the Godhead, maybe all of us believe the truth about the Godhead, is an important doctrine that needs to be understood. And I can think of other things. Well, I feel this way too. But there was a time when the, the message of the Godhead, the emphasis on the Godhead, absorbed my time. It filled my horizon. And I talked about it all the time. Not so much these days. I still talk about it. I still believe it is important. But I recognize that any doctrine, every doctrine and any doctrine is just a doctrine if that's where it stops. Everything that you ever learn is intended to take you someplace. Everything in Christianity is intended to take you someplace. And until you get to that place, you don't know the truth. And I believe that is one of the greatest problems that exist in the movement that we belong to. It's that people take doctrines and they argue about doctrines and they emphasize doctrines and they have no clue where it is all supposed to go. Well, what is truth? The popular concept is that truth is a statement which expresses what is factually accurate. So, we normally think that, okay, if it's not true, then it's false. Because obviously the, the, the opposite of true is false. So if I were to ask what is truth, the answer I would get from most people is that it is what is factually accurate. Now, this is, 
This is the way I understood things for a long time with regard to the biblical teaching until I came across some statements that didn't make sense or that could not be defined in this way. Statements in the Bible that talk about truth. And it made me look at it more carefully. And I found that in the Bible, truth is not always intended to say what is factually accurate. There's another implication to it, a deeper implication, a stronger implication, which changes the picture entirely. Let's look at just a couple of verses to illustrate what I'm talking about. Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2 is where I want to start. It says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true, the what? The true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Now, when, G, when, when Paul talks about the true tabernacle, what is he contrasting it with? The, 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 the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. The tabernacle that was built by Moses and later on was, was built out of marble and stone and gold and precious material by Solomon. Now, now Paul talks about the sanctuary or the tabernacle that the Lord pitched in heaven itself, and he said, this is the true tabernacle. Now, is he saying that what Moses made was a false tabernacle? No. He's not saying it was false. So if you think about this, you recognize that in this context, our definition of true has to be a little different. He's not saying the one that God made himself is a true one, so the one that Moses made was false because it was God himself who told Moses to build that tabernacle. So, I mean, you, you, you can pick up immediately that what Paul is talking about is the reality versus the representation. Now, this is one of the things that I don't, I don't know if I can say generally that Christians in general don't pick up when they read the Bible or I, I have to say, it's, it's people within independent Adventism. I don't know if I should say this, but I have encountered so many people who don't seem to see this, 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 this distinction in the Bible. They don't see the difference between representation and reality. They try to make representation and reality equal. They think that the representation is just as significant and just as important as the reality. Now, let me make that point. Let, let, let's emphasize that point so we, we, we don't forget it. What Paul is saying is that the thing that Moses built was only a representation. It was not false because God told him to build it. It was, it was an actual building, but it was not the reality of what God, of, of where, where salvation really takes place. It was just a representation. It was, like, it was like a child's toy, if you want to use a graphic illustration. It was like an illustration or a picture, a painting, an acted parable. It was not the reality where salvation, the things of salvation, actually took place. As real as it was in its own setting, it was real as a teaching tool. It was real as a representation, just like the little boy's toy car is real. It's a real toy. It's made of metal. It's painted in yellow or red, but it's not, it's not uh, uh, the reality of a genuine motor car. It's still a real representation. And that is what Paul is saying here. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that this idea is all over the New Testament. And there are many places where we, come up, where we come upon the word true or truth. And we need to, to substitute the word real or reality if we are to get a proper understanding. I just want to start with one verse in particular. Let me start with this, but I'll go to some others. Look at John 1 and verse 17.
if you don't understand what I'm saying, then you're going to be puzzled by this verse, as I was puzzled for a long, long time. In the old days, before I came to understand certain aspects of righteousness in Christ, this verse was one of those verses that I read and just didn't understand what it is saying. The verse says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now somebody says, take out the word but, because it's not in the original. It's a supplied word. It's in italics. All right, take out the word. Let me read it again. For the law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You still can't get away from the fact that the verse is contrasting what Moses brought, or what Moses was used to bring, with what God brought through Jesus Christ. He's saying both things are not equal. The first thing that he mentions is not grace and truth. And in case you don't see that, that contrast, because one friend of mine who is very fixated on the law, he says, I'm misapplying the verse, because the verse should say, for the law was given by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He says both, both sides of the statement are complementary. One is adding to the other. It's not contrasting both things. All right. Let's see if the Bible agrees with him because I go to Hebrews 7 and verse 19 and what do I see? For the law made nothing perfect. Can you finish that verse? But the, but the bringing in of a better hope did. That better hope is Jesus Christ and what he brought. I'm not exaggerating. I can give you a dozen verses that show you the same contrast between what the law brought and what Jesus Christ did. I believe that God gave us a holy law. I'm not attacking the law. I have to say this every time because over the past 11 years that I've been preaching about righteousness by faith, people have, have made the statement that I'm attacking the law. And this is not true. To put the law in its rightful place is not attacking the law. You know, you have good and you have better and you have best, right? When you take good and you put it where best belongs, what do you have to do? You have to move it from that place. Because when, bet, when, when good sits in the place of best, best can never take its place. You will always be second class. You will always be less than God wants you to be because you don't you're not, where God, you're not at the pinnacle where God wants you to be. When you put the law where Christ belongs, the law has to be put in its right place. If you have put the law in the wrong place, something has to happen. And if you think that is tearing down the law, that is unfortunate because it is all over the New Testament. Paul says we are delivered from the law. Paul says the law made nothing perfect. Paul says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Paul talks about the ministry of death that was abolished. And at the same time, Paul says the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good. Paul says, do we then make void the law through faith? No, we establish the law. So you have to harmonize both things. And what he's saying is not that the law is bad. He's saying the law has been put where it doesn't belong. And it has to be moved because only Jesus Christ belongs at the pinnacle. So what, Paul, what, what, G, what John was saying here in John 1 and verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Substitute for the word truth, the word reality. The law was given by Moses, but grace and reality came by Jesus Christ. The law is not the reality of what God wants. That's what John is saying. And that is the message of the New Testament. It says in, in, in Hebrews 10 verses 1 and 2, For the law having a shadow of good things to come. That's what the law was. It was a shadow. And everybody knows that a, a shadow has no substance to it. A shadow is, it really is there, you can see it. But a shadow is not the substance, it's not what you want. What you want is the reality. You want the real thing. You want the real person. And that the word of God says, the law was given by Moses. Yes, 
It was not Moses who gave it. It's God who gave it to Moses. But it's interesting that John says it was given by Moses because the point John wants to make is that what God did through the man Moses was the best God could do through a man. And it just was not good enough because a man can never bring grace and truth. That had to come by Jesus Christ. Is what he's saying. The law did not deal with real things. Let's not make any mistake about that. I ask people all the time, can you name me one thing in the law that dealt with reality? And they say, what do you mean? I say, just start naming anything under the system of the law. What? Peace offerings, meat offerings, drink offerings, the sanctuary, the nation of Israel, the land of Palestine. Name me something that had Real, eternal worth. Because the sanctuary was not real. The people that were called God's people were not really God's people. Because God's people are not flesh and blood. God's people are people who are, who are his people in the spirit. Not because they are, they are born of Abraham's bloodline. The land of Palestine is not the promised land. We, our, our land is Jerusalem above. Everything in that system was representational. The very system of government represented the new covenant. So, the whole system was not reality. It was, a, it was a symbol of something greater that came with Jesus Christ. Think about this, brothers and sisters. And I'm, I'm saying this, and there, there are many things going through my mind. I'm trying not to be too jumbled. I have a friend who says, I have several friends who say, that everything that Jesus Christ brought when he came to earth 2,000 years ago, everything was already available from the beginning of the world. It was all here from the beginning. They say the plan of salvation was already implemented, set in place, and working from the time that Adam sinned. The Bible does not teach it. The Bible says grace and truth, reality began with Jesus Christ. What the Bible teaches is that before Jesus came, God set up a system that represented salvation. That's why all these animals had to be killed, representing Christ, right? That's why this sanctuary and this earthly priesthood, everything was in place representing something that would come afterwards. But when Jesus came, in the Hebrew system, the first thing that would happen, the beginning of their, uh, 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 of, of, of their call by God and the beginning of God setting up the system by which he governed them, it began at the Passover. When God took them out of Egypt that night, God said to Moses, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. The first event in the history of God's people, Israel, in this teaching tool, the first event was deliverance from Egypt, the death of the Passover lamb. When did that happen? In reality, when did the real thing happen? It happened when Jesus died on Calvary. That was the beginning of salvation. Until Jesus died, salvation had not come to this planet. If you don't believe me, go to Revelation 12 and read verse 10 and you'll see what the Bible says there clearly. Now is come salvation. It came at the death of Jesus Christ. Not before. Anyway, that's not what I'm talking about this evening, but I just have to Put, it in, uh, put in a few things to, to, to clarify my point. Now, we have been brought up in a system that makes it difficult for us to accept something like this. And I'm not attacking anybody or anything, right? I, I, I have been... The, the people who view things and put the law at the center. They mean well. They, they mean well. They are standing, they're trying to stand against the, 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 the anarchy and the lawlessness in the world. And they honestly, I believe, do think that God's answer to the, the chaos in the, in, in the world and in the church is the system of the law. I think they do believe this. But you know, a brother in Jamaica said to me not so long ago, and it sticks in my, mind, in my mind, he said, sincerity is not righteousness. 
It's stuck in my mind. He said, sincerity is not righteousness and sincerity is not faith. And it's stuck in my mind. Because I realize that the most sincere people on the earth, well, I don't know, but they were very sincere. The Jews, right? The Jews were people who were totally fixated on the law. I wanted to notice how Paul describes them. When Paul talks about the Jews in Romans 2 and verse 17, here's what he says. Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. What is he saying? He's saying that you Jews, okay, you're called a Jew, okay, what is your hope and your confidence? You rest in the law. Do you know that the Jews thought that because they were born under this system called the law, it made them God's special people? Do you know there are some people today who think the same thing? That because they, 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 they have a statement that says they keep the Ten Commandments, it makes them God's special people? Do you know there are people who believe that the name or the place where they are born or the church they belong to makes them special to God? Paul is saying the same thing to the Jews. You are called a Jew, you rest in the law, you make your boast of God because of the law. And this is exactly how it is with the Jews. As you know, when, when a Jewish boy is 13, he goes through a ceremony called his bar mitzvah. You know it means that he becomes a son of the law. Bar, son, mitzvah, the law. He, becomes a, he goes through bar mitzvah when he's 13. The pinnacle in the life of a Jewish boy when he, ter when he moves from childhood to manhood is that he becomes a son of the law. God says we become sons of who? We become sons of the living God. But these people believe that the greatest, the high point of their existence is to become a son of the law. It tells you how they regard the law. They think a relationship with the law is what makes them God's people. Wrong! This attitude, look at the Pharisees, listen to them talking to Jesus. They send some men to arrest Jesus, okay? The men go there and they hear, they see a man and they hear things that are not possible for a mere human being and they come back lost in wonder. And the Pharisees say, why have you not brought him? And they say, Never man speak like this man. In John 7, 47 to 49, it says, Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. In their opinion, if you don't know the law, you can't quote the law, you're under a curse. So, so, really, you could say, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that the, 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 the Jews worshipped the law. Honestly, what they did, they, they displaced God with the law. Instead of worshipping God, God, they worshipped the law. There are the people who murdered God's son and, and, and went home to keep the Sabbath, right? They didn't want him on the cross to defile the Sabbath. The lunacy... That makes you absorbed in a set of rules or in a system so that you become so lost in it that you, you, you lose sight of the purpose of the system and where it was intended to take you and the one who actually set up the system. It's tragic. And the thing is that people today don't set out to be like that. They don't set out to operate in this way. But the point is, we humans have the capacity to be absorbed in God has designed us to worship only one thing. We have been designed that way. There's a, there, there is something in our psyche that is made for worship. And something has to fill that place. And if that position is taken by anything other than God, you become an idolater. Even of something good. You become an idolater even in, in worshiping something that is good in itself. But you become an idolater because God is not at the center. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the what? I am the truth. And again, I want you to substitute the word reality for that word truth. Now, 
I gave this some thought because I do ask the question that, that I know many people ask. What does it mean to have Jesus? If I say Jesus is the reality, then what is the form or the representation? Somebody was quoting just now that the Bible says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So what is the law? The law is a series of teachings. It's a series of types and representations. It's a series of commands. And the whole system was intended to bring us to Christ. So we have come to Christ. Have we? And how do we come to Christ? Because there are many Christians who believe that Jesus is, when you come to Christ, it means that you get a different set of teachings from what the law teaches you. So Christ versus the law is just a difference of different set, a different set of teachings. Are you seeing what I'm saying? That is not what the Bible means at all, because whether it is the teachings of Christ or the teachings of the law, it is still not reality. To give you an illustration, right? Somebody teaches you about gravity. They might teach you all the principles of gravity, how it works. I don't know how it works, but I understand that gravity may have something to do with some fundamental elements in the atom, at the atomic level. You might go through all of this, something called the graviton, I, I hear. And you understand, and you work it all out. Does it mean that you experience gravity because you know gravity? You can define gravity? To know Jesus doesn't mean that you can define who Jesus is and talk about what he teaches. Is this what it means to come to Christ? Listen to what Jesus says in John 5, 39 and 40. He says, in the, in the King James Version, it says, search the scriptures. It's a command. But if you read any other translation, you get the right Meaning, because it's not a command, it's a comment that Jesus is making. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. That's exactly what the Jews believed. They believed that because they were people of the book. And because they knew the doctrines, they had eternal life by knowing ideas. But he said... But they are they that testify of me. Yet you will not come to me that you, will not have li that you might have life. He was not saying you will not come to a different set of doctrines. That's not what he was saying at all. Jesus is a person. He's a living person. And Jesus comes to live inside of us by his Holy Spirit. In a living experience where divinity and humanity become again united in one. This is what it means to possess Jesus Christ. This is the new covenant. This is what it means to have the reality. It's not having doctrinal ideas. As important as those may be. The reality of having Jesus Christ is having his spirit living in you. In a living relationship where you and God share the same life. That is what it means. It means nothing less. I'm saying that unapologetically and I hope everybody understands. If all you have is a doctrine, no matter how beautiful, even if it is the truths about righteousness by faith, you have nothing. You are still dealing with form and shadow and representation. Jesus Christ is a living gift that God has given to us. And to have the reality means to have Jesus himself in this way. That's what Jesus, I tell you, sometimes I feel it. That I have to take the hard road because I never had the privilege to, 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 to walk with Jesus and it seems like the disciples had it so simple because he said, listen, I'm not leaving you comfortless. I will come to you. My father and I will come and make our home with you. I will be with you forever. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And they just, they just knew it was true. They just knew it was true. We have to battle with faith. We have to struggle and fight. To believe the simple words. But you know Jesus said. Because Thomas said. You know I'm not going to believe. Unless I push my hand in his side. Or see the, the scars in his hand. 
And when Jesus appeared, he said, Thomas, come, push your hand in my, push, push your hand in my side and touch the scars and see that it is I. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, because you have seen, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Jesus anticipated and understood our position. He understood. That gives me comfort. So even in the struggle to have that kind of faith, to experience what they experienced, even though I have not heard it from his own lips, to take the Bible as his living word that I may believe and accept what he has done, even though I never had the chance to push my hand in his side, I know that he anticipated and understood what we must go through and he knew that he would give us enough that we make it in spite of our disadvantages. And that is what I take comfort in and take consolation in and know that no matter how, how, how challenging, it, challenging it is, it is ours to take that reality. He has given it to us. All that they ever possessed before Jesus came, that is the point I'm making, was illustration, form, representation. The reality is Jesus Christ. It's interesting, you know, 12 years ago, for 30 years of my life, up to, up to, up to 12 years ago, I studied I try to find out what it means that Christ is our righteousness. And I, I read where we were told Christ must be the center of every sermon. And Christ is to be lifted up before the world. So I try. Every time I, I, I gave a sermon or a Bible study, I try to mention Jesus. I tried to put him in there somewhere. But you know, it was hard work. It was hard work. Because there were so many things I had to say, so many doctrines where it seemed like Jesus had no business there. And when this is happening, I can tell you today that when this is happening, you have not yet understood what God did for us in his son. You have not yet understood. For the past 11 years since I've understood. I can hardly think of anything else to talk about. I can't find a doctrine in the Bible that I don't see Jesus all over it. He's the very center of it. I finally understand what it means that Christ is all and in all. A brother said to us in Washington, D.C., we were, we were there just a few days ago before he came here, he said, he said when, I, when I heard what you were saying 11 years ago, I said, okay, let's see how soon we're going to move on to something else because surely we are going to exhaust this. And he said, it has been 11 years and every day I'm hearing something more wonderful. I tell you, I was happy when I heard that because it is the truth. It is the truth. You're reading the same Bible and everything takes on a, an absolutely different aura. One brother said to Howard in Jamaica, he said, you, 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 you fellas, all you do is talk about Jesus, Jesus. You don't even mention the law. And he said it so Howard could feel bad and Howard said, praise the Lord. Somebody else said the same thing to me on Facebook recently, a brother from Romania, right? All we do is talk about Jesus all the time. He said it in a condemnatory way. In fact, he said it in such a way because he used to be my friend and he turned against me because of this and he said it in such a, such a, a, a sharp way. He made me stop and think. You know, I really did a, 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 a serious look at it. Am I wrong? Am I wrong because the brother was so grieved? I'm thinking this kind of grief must have some kind of basis. Am I wrong? Because his criticism is that all we do is talk about Jesus. And after thinking about it for a while, I ended up thinking, how can anybody be so crazy? How can Christians be so misguided as to say you are talking too much about Jesus? You know, I can understand if you are using vain repetition. 
Like some people say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And there's no meaning, nor sense, nor intent behind it. Just, just a mantra. But when you're talking about Jesus, and every, every time you look, you see something more beautiful, and you keep on talking, and you don't have time to go anywhere else, because there's so much, there's such a depth and a vast world in him. How can anybody with a heart for the Lord say, you are doing too much, it's time to move on to something else. Jesus truly is God's everything. Everything that is worthwhile in the Bible or in life points to him. And I'm saying to you, if there's anybody in here who does not know or understand this, I hope you'll take me seriously and go back and re-examine and see how your life is oriented. Because if Jesus is not at the center, you don't understand God's plan for this planet yet. You don't understand what salvation means yet. You don't understand the gospel yet. I can say that confidently, and if you understand, you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. Now, I don't know the position of everybody inside here, but that is one of the reasons why, as you know, I have a very strong position against peacekeeping. Peacekeeping is growing by leaps and bounds in the independent movement. In fact, those of you who believe the truth about the Godhead, as we like to phrase it, you believe that God is a father and a son and not a trinity. In the Godhead movement, peacekeeping has taken a, a strong foothold and it is advancing by leaps and bounds. I am one who consider, considers it a very dangerous thing. Some of my friends say, well, it's harmless. If people want to keep feast, that's their business. Why does it bother you? Well, it bothers me like it would bother me if Christians went back to sacrificing animals. Would that be a problem? You know, you'd say, just leave them alone to sacrifice animals if they want. But then you say, what are they saying to people about Christianity? Where are they taking people? What are they doing with Christ? Because the more you focus on the form the less you interact with the reality. It's like a man who owns a, a truck and his boy has toy cars and he leaves his truck and he goes to playing with toy cars. He has taken leave of his senses, right? He has left reality for form and representation. You can't have both things at the same time and the Bible teaches you. The Bible says the law had a shadow. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. The law having a shadow of good things to come. Future things, right? The law was relevant until the better things arrived. You play with toys until you become a man. You play with dolls until you become a woman. When you're a, 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 an adult and you play with the toys, somebody has to question your sanity. Going back to playing with toys is a backward move. It's like, it's like a grown man gets a blow to his head and he goes back to being a baby and he starts behaving like a baby again. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, uh, in just a moment. Bringing back Christianity under the yoke of the law, seeking God by means of the illustration, is not a healthy thing for Christianity. I know why it happens. Okay, I know that there are many Christians who have never actually received Christ. They have had an interaction with the theory of the word. They have had an interaction with, with the, the system of law. They have never known Christ. So it's, it's, not strange. it's not strange that these people find themselves comfortable going back to the works of the law. But it is still tragic. All of us should be moving forward. If we have never known Christ before or, we, or if we have been locked in the illustration then we all should be going forward and upward to the reality. That's where we should be taking other people, not dragging them back further into the system of representation. And that is why this whole thing is so challenging and so disturbing. Jesus met a woman in Samaria. And we're all familiar with that story. But I want us to look a little more closely and examine his message and his main point a little more clearly, a little more closely. He met this woman. The woman 
talk to him a little bit. This woman was a loose woman. She had had five husbands. The man she was with at the moment was not her husband. And when Jesus told her everything, she recognized that he was somebody unusual. She recognized he was a prophet. And in spite of the fact that he had exposed her life, opened up everything, she was so intrigued and so anxious to find somebody like this that she went right away into questioning him. And she asked the question that was burdening her heart and that infects the minds of many people today, right? Her question was, which is a true church? Now, she never asked it like that. She said, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And she stopped, but her unspoken question was, which is the true place of worship? Because you see, the Samaritans were half Jews. They were a hybrid race, if you want to give it, give, call it that. They were something like, like me, <laughs> because I'm a mixture, right? But the Jews, they don't deal with mongrels. They are purebred, right? If you had the slightest degree of any other kind of blood in you, you could not take part in the Jewish services. You could not be a part of the priesthood. You could not eat of the Passover. So this is why over the centuries, over the generations, Judaism has been so exclusive. It won't mingle even when they move, among, move to live in other countries. They try to keep the religious Jews. They keep strictly within the bounds of Judaism because it's related to the law. Now, the Samaritans, when, when the Assyrians took away the ten tribes and carried them away and scattered them heaven knows where, they left a few people in the land. They left a few of the poor people and the old people and in the land. And these people eventually intermingled with the surrounding nations. But they still kept to their Jewish ways. So, so these people were the Samaritans. So, but they believed they were still Jews, still God's people. But the, 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 the other Jews would have nothing to do with them. Because for the, these Jews, they were worse than dogs because they had mingled the pure seed, right? So, what the Samaritans did was they, they, they lived in that part of Palestine where the original sanctuary had been set up. And the Jews, of course, had built one in Jerusalem. So the Samaritans continued to worship in their temple over in Samar Samaria, and the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem. So, of course, like every good offshoot group, the Samaritans said, we are God's true people. And the Jews said, nonsense, we are God's true people. So, you know, she asked, she's asking Jesus the question, which is the true place to worship? What does God accept and acknowledge as his, right? And we could look at the verse in John chapter 4. And, um, you know, there are several... Several verses. Probably we should just go there and look at a few of these so we can get exactly what he's saying. John 4. And we can start from about verse 23. John 4. Right. Right. In fact, I'll go back to verse 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, the hour is coming, when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now when he says the hour cometh, up to this point in time, was it a legitimate thing to worship God in one of those places? Was it something God would have accepted up to this point? Yes, because it says the hour is coming. So up to this point, God did accept people worshiping in Jerusalem or in that mountain. But it goes on. Verse 22. 23. 
but the hour cometh. And now is the hour has arrived when the what? The true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In reality, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus says that up to this point in time, God has accepted a certain kind of worship. In fact, God not only accepted a certain kind of worship, God instituted that kind of worship. It was God who told them three times a year, all your tribes must appear before me at Jerusalem. It was God who told them, build sanctuary and you must come there to worship, bring your sacrifices. God who told them that the people must gather outside the sanctuary on the day of atonement. God gave them this kind of worship. But the Bible says it was a shadow of good things to come. That's what the Bible says. Now Jesus says the hour has arrived when this system is to change. Why must it change? Because I have come to make you understand God is spirit. And because God is spirit, the only worship that is really acceptable to God is worship that is in spirit and in reality. What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? It means not to worship, to limit your worship to places or, or the system of the law, to put it simply. Now, do you believe that people still worship in that mountain today? Yes, probably. And I believe people probably still worship in Samaria today. So, so Jesus is not saying you are forbidden to worship in these places. What he's saying is that you can't limit God who is a spirit to those systems of worship. You can't do this. To do this is to belittle and to demean God. Can you see what I'm saying? The Jews had God locked in a box. When they went to war, they said, bring the box with us, otherwise God won't be with us, right? They took their God with them in a box. They believed that when they wanted to consult God, they had to find a place, a certain spot. Their God was small, and God catered to that kind of thinking because God was dealing with them as children. Their worship of God was represented by Limited seasons, feast days. Offering certain kinds of sacrifices at certain times. Washings and Paul calls them car carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. He says that in Hebrews 9, I think it's about verse 9 or thereabouts. Carnal ordinances, worldly ordinances imposed on them until... The time of reformation. God catered to their limited understanding. But he says look here. The time has come for this to change. In Galatians chapter 4 it says. When the fullness of the time was come. God sent his son made of a woman. Made under the law. To deliver them who were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. God says I'm done with this system. God says 1500 years of it is enough. My people are ready now for maturity. I've sent my son to establish this greater system. And those who worship God now must worship him in spirit and in truth. And God is looking for these kinds of people to worship him. God is seeking for worshipers. And he's not seeking for those who worship in that limited, childish, impotent way that never made anything perfect. He's looking for people who understand the kind of God we worship and relate to him in that way. You know, humanity is always looking for the human nature, human instinct is looking for sense-oriented sense things on which to base our faith. Man says, you know, you, do you know why the Catholics have images? You say Catholics worship images. Have you ever accuse a Catholic of this and heard his answer? Well, if you accuse the Catholics of worshipping images, they'll say, we don't worship images. You'll say, why are these images in your church? They say these are only to help us to focus on the reality. They say they don't worship the image, but it helps them to focus on the reality to which the images point. They see logic and reason in that. The, the brethren 
who are going back to the law are using the same arguments. They say these, these things from the law, they recognize they are not the realities, but they use them to help them to focus on the reality. Why did God forbid these things then if they were really good for us? Because God knows the human tendency to turn to idolatry. And God wants to lift us, lift us to a higher place, to a higher level of operation. Not to operate from the five senses. That's where the world operates, right? This, God wants us to operate on the spiritual level where you can't see or touch and yet you recognize that you live in a world that is just as real. Can you see why Christians today are begging for signs and wonders? Because they want to be into the sensual. But God says those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. You know, when I was a young Christian, I had... I read something one time. I read about a man who had difficulty in praying and so he did something. He, he went into a room, he discovered something. He started praying in a dark room and what he would do, he would get a chair and put in one corner of the room and he'd sit on the other chair and he'd ask the Lord to sit in that chair and he would pray. He would talk to the Lord and he said he had many blessed hours talking to the Lord. So I started practicing it and believe me, I was blessed by it. Sometimes I felt the presence of the Lord in that room so clear, so, so strong, I was afraid to open my eyes. After, after a time, I stopped doing it. And the years passed, and some years ago, I began to think, why did you stop doing that? Because at that moment, I was going through a little dry period in my prayer life, and, I, and, and the thought came, why did you stop doing that? Go back to it, it will help. So, I went back and I started putting the chair there and talking to the chair. And one day I was doing this. And I, it's like I, I heard the Lord say, those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. And I started to think about it and I realized that what I'm doing is using something physical to help me to, to, to get in touch with something spiritual. And I thought, why do I need this? Because what does the Bible say about Jesus? The Bible says that God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. Now, because my faith is not taking hold of what the word of God says and what is true, I'm turning to props. I'm turning to carnal things to try to help me. And I realized that this is exactly what God was trying to get away from when he abolished the system of the law and brought us into the spiritual worship. And since then, I've, I've abolished the chair. <laughs> I started focusing on what the word of God says, that Jesus lives inside of me. And look here. The morning after I came to this conclusion, when I went to pray, the presence of the Lord was so real that my body started shaking. So, you know, it's like the Lord was saying to me, what I have given you is better than what was there. Because if it was better, I would not have ended that system. I would have said to my people, to remind you of what Jesus did, continue killing animals. To remind you of Everything that Jesus means, continue with the system of the law. God knew that that was not the best way for his people to grow. That's why he took it out of the way. And that's what I found happened when I began to just simply take the word of God and focus on what he says and get rid of the props. I found that the blessing is greater that way. So it's tempting to seek for help in a way that is not prescribed by the word of God. And, I, you know, I think the reason why God has forbidden this kind of worship is because of our tendency to idolatry. Men in the world operate from the five senses. Okay, you have, it's what you see, taste, touch, hear, the five senses. Whatever we can see and touch and discern by our five senses, 
we consider this to be reality. And the world says, if you can't discern it with your senses, the scientific method, then it's not real. And so, we Christians are in trouble when we start operating on the same principle. Because I'm going to tell you something. Well, I'm going to talk more about this later this week, so I won't say too much right now. But, but this is the problem when we begin to become sense-oriented in worshiping God. This is a problem. We do not become more spiritual. We become more carnal. We do not become stronger in faith. We become stronger in our connection, our attachment with things that relate to this world. And that is what God wants us to get away from. The Bible has some astonishing statements. You know, like Paul says in Colossians 2. Look here. Look at how God wants us to view ourselves and, and the lives we live. Paul says in Colossians 3, he says, he says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, right? Where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God, right? But in chapter 2, he's even more bold. He's even more astonishing. Listen to what he says. He says, look here. If you then be risen with Christ. Why? As though you are living in the world, why are you still subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using. I don't know if you grasp what he's saying, but it's an astonishing statement. He's saying, look here, you no longer live in this world. You are risen with Christ. Why are you behaving as though you are still living in the world? Why are you still concerned about the rules that say, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. And yet these things, after you handle them, they're all to perish. Why are you concerning yourself about that? Because if you live in heavenly places, these things cannot affect you. It's one of the most amazing statements. But Paul dares to say it because he wants us to understand you don't live in the way of the world. The things of the world don't affect you as a Christian. Because you're a spiritual being and you live in the spiritual realm. That's what he's saying. And you know that's not my statement. That's Paul's statement. Because I wouldn't dare to say something like that. So. The truth is. I'm going to give you another verse. That you know very well. It's John. John says again. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, right? And the truth is not in him. What is not in him? Jesus! Jesus. All right, you know how I heard that interpreted? He does not know the doctrines. He does not know the Ten Commandments. That's not what it is saying at all. Why does a man not keep the commandments? Because Jesus is not in him. You think teaching him all the commandments in the, in the Bible is going to make him keep the commandments? That's the ridiculous idea that has produced so many hypocrites. You teach a man every commandment in the Bible, you think that's going to make him keep them? You're only going to make him more condemned. Because he knows so much and doesn't do it. That's what Paul said to the Jews. Thou callest thyself a Jew and makest thy boast in the law and restest in the law. You who teach others not to steal. Do you steal? So, so what he's saying is, if a man says, I know the Lord and does not keep his commandments, he's a liar. The truth, Jesus Christ, is not in him. Because Jesus Christ is not the author of sin. Jesus Christ is not the author of anarchy. What people need, what we need, what all the world needs, what the Christian world needs, is Christ living inside. Is Christ living inside. When Jesus lives in me, you don't have to talk to me and tell me how I should behave. Furthermore, what you are going to tell me is not good enough, because you're going to tell me to be a rule. Jesus changes my nature. So that I don't need a rule to tell me how to behave, because my nature hates what is not like him. Christ, in, in Jesus Christ, God has found a way, a simple, wonderful way to produce everything that the law was trying to produce and couldn't do it. So Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 21, if there had been a law that could have given righteousness, righteousness would have been by the law. It can't happen. 
It can't happen. So all God could do through the law is use it as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And having come to Christ, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Christ is the goal and the purpose of the law. And having found him, the law has fulfilled its purpose. So I'm saying to everyone, brothers and sisters, if we find ourselves having struggles in our life, if we find ourselves failing, get it right. What is wrong is our relationship with Christ. Not how badly we have been instructed about the law. That's not the issue. The issue is somebody is missing in your life that is critical. He needs to be there. Well, I'm going to end there this evening. But as we continue this week, we will explore some of these things a little more fully. And as I said, I have every assurance that our Father is going to bless us abundantly. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for listening attentively. And I hope you have been blessed, not just in the doctrine, but in the truth. Let us pray.